All right, so uh, my wife, um, Michelle, is a fan of the reality TV show Alone. Any other fans of Alone out there? She got really into Alone during the pandemic uh, when she was sitting on her butt at home all day watching TV. Just kidding. She wasn't doing that. So Alone is a wilderness survival show in which uh, trained survivalists are dropped alone in a desolate wilderness area with a limited number of supplies. Each contestant must brave wildlife, starvation, and weather with basic survival know-how. They record themselves on video, and they're checked in on by doctors to make sure they're not dead. Uh, The last person to survive in the wilderness before tapping out wins $500,000. Now, of all the hardships the contestants must endure on alone, though, the worst is not the bears, the worst is not the cold temperatures, the worst is not the, the food supply, it's the isolation. No matter how trained these men and women are on wilderness survival techniques, humans are social creatures. They're just not meant to live alone in the woods for long periods of time. Almost every contestant eventually realizes this. Uh, One man, a wilderness instructor, uh, tapped out after only two days when he realized how much he missed his wife. Another contestant started to crack when in order to survive, he had to kill a chipmunk who had been, up to that point, his only companion for the weeks he had spent in the woods. Yet another contestant only survived after humanizing a volleyball, so he had someone to talk to. (laughs) Oh, wait, wrong show. So far, so far, nobody has died on a loan, although plenty have come back with psychological damage. At some point, all the contestants realize what the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 2, It is not good for the man to be a contestant on a loan. (laughs) That's what I want to talk to you about this morning, the perils of being alone. So it's the next installment of our current series, which is called Chapter 2, Slow Walk Through the Garden of Eden. We're studying the early chapters of Genesis here at Rooftop. Genesis, in case you don't know, uh, the Bible much. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. It tells the story of the creation of the world, the creation of humankind, The book sets up the entire plot of scripture and introduces us to words and ideas and characters that occur repeatedly throughout the Bible. So we might be familiar with these stories, but we might not have ever really uh, slowed down and meditated on them in a way that really changes us and impacts us as as followers of of Jesus. Now already in our study, we've talked about God creating uh, people from the dust of the earth and what it means that we are all clay pots. We've talked about the Garden of Eden, what it represents. It represents the temple, the church, where heaven and earth meet. Last week, we learned that the man God created wasn't just the first man. He wasn't just the first gardener. He was the first priest of the garden. We are also priests called to work and keep the garden of the church. But as we're going to find out this morning, being a priest in the garden isn't a job any of us can do alone. Right, very good. So let me go ahead and read to you our passage for the morning. It comes from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, the man, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Lots to talk about here, so let's pray. Father, I'm blessed and privileged to be able to Stand before my church family, diving into your holy word. Give us humility and open our minds to see what you are maybe saying to us this morning in a way that helps us live more like Jesus. That is our prayer, that we hear what you are saying so that we may live more like Jesus. 
Thank you for your many blessings that we get to enjoy this morning. Warm buildings, eager volunteers greeting us at doors, watching our children, serving us bagels and coffee. These are all your gifts to us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So even if you're not familiar with the Bible, you actually might recognize this scene. It certainly has one of the most famous lines from Genesis in verse 18. It is not good for the man to be alone. Now, you might recognize this as a departure from the goodness of creation that has been formed up to this point. Everything that God has done in the book of Genesis so far, he has called good. He created the light, and it was good. He created the dome in the sky, and it was good. He created the stars, and it was good. Good. Here, though, we get a record scratch. God sees that the man is all alone, and it is not good. The Hebrew word for good is tov. Everything that God has done is tov. This was tov. That was tov. That was tov. But this is low tov. Not good. Low tov. Now, why is it low tov? Why is it not good? It's not good because the man is alone, but why exactly is it not good for the man to be alone? Is it not good for the man to be alone because he's lonely? Is it not good for the man to be alone because he cannot reproduce? Well, in the context of the story, it's lotov because there is work to do and he can't do it. So remember that God has put the man here to work and care for the garden. He has made the man a priest to guard the garden and care for the garden as sacred space. This is what we talked about last week. The words used, the same words used for work and keep the garden are used for priests in the temple. So the first man was just a gardener, but was God's priestly representative to the rest of the earth called to care for the garden as God's temple. Now I can tell you though, First-hand experience here, being a priest in the temple is hard work. <laughs> you can't do it on your own. There's lots of work. You got to get the service ready. You got to clean the building. You got to greet the people. You got to write the sermons. God sees a man running around being a priest in the garden, and he says, uh-oh, uh-oh, this is Lotov. This man's going to burn out, not good. So God puts together a plan. I will make a helper suitable for him. This is another verse that you might really recognize. Now, I want to point out a couple things about this verse, though. First of all, the word helper does not mean assistant. It's not like the help. God's not given the man an intern or a house cleaner. The word in Hebrew is azer. Now, it's used very frequently in the Bible Mostly in reference to God as a military savior. Yahweh is usually the Azer. God is the help of Israel, not their help or their assistant. He is the one who arrives at the last minute to save their butts. The word helper in English is a very inadequate translation here. But it's one of those best-we-can-do situations. And the word suitable is a really tough word in the Hebrew, too. The verse says a helper suitable for him. The closest meaning is probably opposite or complement, someone who matches the man in a complementary way. So a suitable helper isn't a worthy assistant, but a complementary partner who literally arrives, literally arrives to save the day. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but when I think of a suitable helper, I think of our office administrator, Elizabeth Cook. <laughs> Elizabeth is not an assistant. She is not an intern. She literally comes to the office every day to save our butts. She is our Azair. Elizabeth, our Azair. <laughs> In any event, seeing the man stressed out by all his priestly responsibilities, which he alone has been given to do, God comes up with the plan. What's the plan? He brings in the animals to the man. This is an interesting plan. Here's what the author says. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. 
And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. What is happening here? This is an odd moment. Man, I see that you are overwhelmed, God seems to be saying, so maybe this large bird will help you. What, what do you want to call this large bird? You can name it anything. Ostrich? Okay, strange name, but that's fine. Do you think the large ostrich will help? Okay, if not that, how about this small lizard-like rodent? Do you think this thing will help? What do you want to call it? Pink fairy armadillo? Okay, odd choice. But either way, do you think it will help? Or how about these little guys, these bug-like creatures? What do you want to call them? What? Raspberry crazy ants? You want to call them raspberry crazy ants? Okay, that's fine. Do you think they can help you? What's happening in this moment? Now, it seems to me and to many commentators that this moment is not really about the man naming the animals. And it's not about God suggesting to the man that the Indian crested porcupine would be a good priestly helper. That's not what's going on. What's happening is that the Lord is helping the man understand who he is and what he needs. This is a lesson. The Lord is teaching the man to understand himself. He brings the animals to him, animals that are living creatures like he is, created from the dust of the earth like he is. He has the man name the animals so that he can understand his authority over them and understand them and see how different he is from them. It's possible that God even brings the animals to the man two by two. This is actually how the animals appear to Noah just a few chapters later. So if that's what's going on, imagine what, we, what would be going through the man's mind as he watches the animals parade by him. Hmm, I'm different than these creatures. I'm higher, I'm smarter, I'm more divine. And also, they have partners. Do I, do I get a partner? Where's mine? This is an early lesson on what it means to be a human being. It means to be not an animal, to rule the animals, but to be a human being also means to need other human beings. To be a human being means to be not alone. Presumably the man learns this, which explains what happens next. But for the man, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. So with none of the animals really fitting the bill, God gets creative in an interesting way. He makes the man fall into a deep sleep, a supernatural trance. God removes a rib, closes up the flesh, makes a woman, and brings it to the man. I know that we've heard this story before, maybe a thousand times, but can we acknowledge this is strange? I mean, what? For starters, why a rib? I remember asking this question in Sunday school growing up. Why a rib? <laughs> my youth group leader, my Sunday school leader, explained that God chose a rib because ribs come from the middle of a person. So a woman wasn't created to be above a man or below a man, but equal to a man. I was like, oh, okay. Does the Bible say that? No, she said, but stop asking questions. I was also told that this story explains why men have one less rib than women because women stole it from us, you rib stealers. But here's the thing. First of all, men don't have one less rib than men or women don't have, men don't have one less rib than women. You can actually just count them and compare. And more importantly, the word used here is really interesting. So if you're reading your Bible you'll see that there's a footnote by the word rib. And the word for rib in Hebrew is tzela. And if you look this up in Hebrew dictionary, tzela can mean rib, but that's a very rare meaning. And this is the only place in the Bible where it's translated that way, as rib. Far more often than not, it doesn't mean rib, 
but it means side, as in the side of a building or a side of beef. Now, this is the sort of thing that translators like to debate, and maybe you're not into the sort of thing. Maybe, uh, maybe you are. In my mind, though, there are lots of reasons why side makes a much better translation than rib. Think about it. What makes more sense here? God pulling a rib out of a person or God taking one person and forming two people from two sides? The image just works better. God is taking two halves, two sides from one person and forming two people. God is, forgive me for this, forgive me for this. God is splitting the atom. <laughs> don't, no, don't applaud or don't curse me. <laughs> That's not original. That's an old Bible joke. To me... God isn't pulling a rib out of a man to form a woman. He is splitting a person and making two opposite people. So as much as the man and the woman are opposite and complementary, they are also equal halves. Now next week, we're going to look at the next verse when the man wakes up and realizes what has happened. He sings a song and things get hot and heavy real quick. (laughs) After looking at all the animals, the man has finally found something to be excited about. But first, I want to talk about what all this means for us. Now, you might know that not only is this a very interesting story, but it is also ground zero for a lot of debates that Christians have concerning the relationship between uh, men and women, husbands and wives. The New Testament authors actually reflect on this scene on at least a couple uh, occasions, drawing their own conclusions about men and women. Uh, Some people, for example, read this story and think that the story means that God has empowered men with a greater amount of leadership and authority in the home, the church, and society, and they think this because the man was created first, the woman was created as a helper out of the man, and also because the woman was the first one to sin in the next chapter, which we'll talk about eventually. Others think the story emphasizes the equality of men and women. The first man isn't really the first man, but the first human, which is what the word Adam can mean. Also, the woman was created to be a co-priest with the man in the garden, not an assistant. And the woman doesn't come out of the man as much as the man and the woman come out of each other. Huge books have been written on these questions. We are not going to solve it this morning In fact, the reason the debate about the relationship between men and women is so intractable and so complicated is because stories like this one in Genesis can legitimately be interpreted either way. You can read this story and think it teaches equality between the sexes, or you can read this story and think it teaches male authority. We just all have our theological eyeglasses through which we interpret complicated texts. But that's all I want to say about that. Because honestly, I don't think male and female relationships is the the author's main point here. This is another example of us turning the Bible into a debate text and maybe missing the point. I think the author is making a bigger point in this passage. You see, up to this point, the passage isn't about marriage. It becomes about marriage next week, but at this point, it's not. The passage isn't about the relationship between men and women. The passage is about community. The passage is about teamwork. The passage is about God giving us the help we need to do his work. That's what's really going on here. Genesis doesn't say it's not good for the man to be unmarried. He says it's not good for the man to be alone. God puts the man in the garden to do a really big job, one too big for him to do, and then God provides the help so that they can get the job done. That's the message we need to hear. You see, we all have big jobs to do. Like we talked about last week, we're all gardeners in the Garden of Eden. We're all priests called to work and keep the garden. Now, I'm talking primarily about the church. The church is the garden of God. We are, we are the place where heaven and earth meet. But there are other gardens too. I mean, your, your family might be a garden where heaven and earth meet. Your place of business might be a garden where heaven and earth meet. Your literal garden might be a place where heaven and earth meet. 
But you can't do it on your own. You need help. And God wants to give it to you. How does he do that? Gives us each other. Gives us communities. Gives us spouses. Gives us churches. Gives us friends. God knows more than anybody that it's not good for people to be alone. I mean, God himself is a Trinitarian being who lives in an eternal family of Father, Son, and Spirit. God does nothing on his own. And if God doesn't do anything on his own, he knows we can't. So he gives us the help we need in each other. Now, that doesn't mean that it always plays out perfectly. You see, we are human beings. We don't always live the way we were designed to. Even though God gives us helpers, so many of us still live our lives alone. Even in this room, even as we sit here surrounded by people, I would hazard to guess that a very high number of us feel alone right now. We are overwhelmed by the challenges of life, lost in our own problems, doubtful that anyone cares or understands or can do anything to help us. Even though we're surrounded by people, it's very easy to feel alone in a crowd. It's very easy to feel alone in a marriage. It's very easy to feel alone in a family. It's very easy to feel alone in a friendship. It's very easy to feel alone in a church. Like you're lost in the wilderness with nothing but chipmunks and volleyballs to keep company. How do we get the help we need then? If God promises to give us helpers, to give us help, how do we get it? Well, that's what I want to talk about with my remaining few minutes. I want to talk about the two things God requires from his people in order for us to get the help we need from each other. I want to talk about receiving help and giving help. First, receiving help. I've already pointed out how in Genesis, God seems to set the man up to see with his own eyes how he needs help. He has a huge job. He gives him a huge job to do and watches as the man realizes he can't do it. The Lord brings him the animals for him to interview as possible helpers, leading him to the conclusion that none of them can be the help he needs. This is what good parents do, by the way. They teach their kids how to ask for help, which starts by helping them understand that they need help. This can be a hard lesson for children, though. Uh, When my kids were little, for example, and they were doing a job or a task or something, if you're a parent, you know this, they didn't want your help. Whether it was building blocks, planting flowers, baking cookies, they would constantly turn me down. I can do it myself, they said. I knew they couldn't. (laughs) They're three or four years old. They're going to screw it up. But they need to realize that on their own. So Michelle and I would just let them burn the cookies. Let them paint the carpets. Let them kill the plants. They need to realize on their own how much they need the help we can actually offer. I think God does the same thing. Sometimes he shows us how we need help through our own failures and limitations. He stands back and watches while we fail, not because he hates us but because he loves us. It can be very hard for some of us to ask for help, though. We might have an exaggerated understanding of our own strength. We might be embarrassed for anyone to see how messed up we are. We might be in a rush, too much in a rush to ask for help. We might not have gotten to know that many people who can even help us. We might not have cultivated a life of relationships. Whatever the case, in order for us to learn to ask for help, God needs to let us fail, sometimes over and over and over and over again. As the book of James says, you do not have because you do not ask for help. I've told you this story before, but uh, several years ago, I was finishing my, refinishing my floors. I got those floors so shiny. It looked like a dance studio in my house. I might have even danced around on the floors. I was so proud of these floors. I worked so hard on them, and I did it all myself. At least most of it. 
You see, I was convinced I could finish the job on my own. I had stuffed all my furniture in the kitchen while I was refinishing my floors. I was eager to put the, put the furniture back after the floors dried. Instead of calling a neighbor or a friend, though, I thought I could move my furniture back by myself. And when I moved the couch to its spot, though, I ended up putting an 18-inch gash in my brand new shiny floors. At this moment, I might have screamed. I might have cursed. I patched it up, but it didn't look the same. And for the remaining years we lived at this house, this blemish, this blemish just stared at me from the floor, reminding me of my pride at not asking for help. This happens sometimes. God lets us gash our floors, hoping we learn how to ask for help. And until we realize that, we're just going to keep gashing floors. And the danger of this is that the worse your life gets, the harder it is to ask for help. I mean, you gash your floor so many times, you wonder what the point is. Well, my floors look like crud anyway. You're so in debt, you stop even looking at the credit card statement. You're so addicted to alcohol, you don't even try recovery. You're so overweight and unhealthy, you're just resigned to a heart attack. Your family is such a mess that, you know, what's the point of even trying therapy? But God wants to help you. He can. It's just not good for a man or woman to be alone. Now, God might have a better idea than you of the help you need. We have this conversation with people who need benevolence assistance here at Rooftop all the time. People come and ask for help paying bills. And we tell them, okay, we want to help, but let's talk about the best way to help. We could just write you a check or we could sit down and talk about budgeting and what's going on at home. God wants to give you good help. And he can. you got to see that, though. you got to ask for it. This is one of the reasons why I'm so encouraged by our Celebrate Recovery ministry, which meets up here on Tuesday nights. These people know they need help. And even though some of them have pretty serious addictions, they just haven't let it stop them from getting the help they need. What kind of help do you need? Have you asked for it? Are you willing to receive it? Receive help. There's another half to finding help in each other, though, and it's giving help. God gives us the help we need in each other, but in order for that to work, we actually have to help each other. So I'm a big believer that the Lord has given us everything we need to follow Jesus and live in community with each other. As 2 Peter says, in his divine power, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. God has given us everything we need to mature and grow as a church. God has given us everything we need to grow in the love and the holiness of Jesus. God has given us everything we need for a happy marriage, to make a den in this community. God has given us everything we need, but that doesn't mean that we'll live that way. Why not? Because we can be selfish with our time and money. We can be distracted and busy. We can be reluctant to open our lives and homes to other people. We can be clueless about how to truly help each other. This is why helpful people are such important people to have in our lives and to have in our churches. We have much to learn from them. In fact, did you know that helping others, helping people, it's actually listed as a spiritual gift? So in the book of Corinthians, Paul talks about the many different people in a church. God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing and of helping. Churches need helpers. God gives them to us. The good news is that Rooftop has lots of them here, lots of helpers, starting with my wife. So when God formed Matt Herndon from the dust of the earth so long ago, and he decided to start a church in St. Louis, the Lord was not convinced this was a good idea. You know Matt Herndon. He's kind of a wild card. Neurotic, insecure, goofy, hyper-emotional, egotistical. Probably not good pastor material, God thought. Oh, great. (laughs) Putting young Matt Herndon in in charge of a church by himself. Low tove. (laughs) Low tove. Not good. But God thought, okay, I can work with this. What did he do? He caused the young Pastor Hernan to fall into a deep sleep. 
He took from him one of his sides, ribs, doesn't matter, patched up the flesh, formed a woman named Michelle to come in and help. And at this point, the Lord knew that Rooftop had a chance. At that point. With such a woman of intelligence and competence and compassion, a woman who could ride in to save the day on many occasions, he knew Rooftop had a chance. You see, among my wife's many gifts is the fact that mostly, mostly, Michelle is a helper and is there. If there is a need she thinks she can help with, she will try. She led our kids' ministry in the early days. She cooked meals for many hungry families. She's watched kids and volunteered at countless events. She has made hospital visits for sick congregants, taken late-night phone calls about medical situations. When it was announced that we needed help in the tech booth on the projection team, despite her many Sunday morning commitments, she agreed to help. So your pastor's wife sits there right now clicking slides so you can worship and learn. And she's not even asking for applause or thanks. But you can thank her if you want. In fact, on your way out, she's right there. Just thank her on your way out. But she's not the only one. The reason Rooftop is a healthy church family is because God has given us the help we need in each other and a lot of us have taken up the call. But not all of us and maybe not you. And until we're all giving the help we can to each other, the work won't be done. And we'll all just feel a little too alone in the woods. We're going to close this morning by singing a song together which reminds us of these things. It's a song about how in Christ we are never alone. Even when everyone abandons us, our friends, our family, we are never alone. The Bible says this too. I've been reading through uh, the Psalms recently in the morning and I read this in Psalm 27 recently. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me. Answer me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper, my Azair. Even if my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will receive me and I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In each other, God gives us the help we need to live our lives and build his kingdom. God gives us families. God gives us friends. God gives us pastors. God gives us leaders. God gives us elders. God gives us neighbors. But we're going to fail each other. We eventually do. We don't come through. We drop the ball. We miss the call. God won't, though. He gives us the help we need. In Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and lives by his spirit in our hearts, he gives us the help we need if we receive it.